I told the director of our of Cedars. I said to him, "I will do anything you guys ask me to do while I'm here. I won't ask questions. I'm in your hands. I trust you guys. I'm all in." Hey guys, so that was just a few words from uh, today's guest, Aaron Gledlow of the Detox Chunky Facebook page. He's uh, he's got a page that's really blown up. It's about recovery and well, all the things. Anyway, our title sponsor for today is the Yatra Treatment Center here in Krabby, Thailand, where I reside. They uh, they are a trauma center. They're they're unique. They're one of a kind. My whole healing journey here in Thailand started when I came to attend their thirty day residential treatment program. Completely transformed my life. They, uh, they're, they're well worth checking out, guys. They are a clinic run by clinicians, not a business run by businessmen. And they know that where addiction is a smoke, trauma is a fire. Learn more at their website. It's uh, www.yatracenter.com. Here, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and remember, that's Y-A-T-R-A-C-E-N-T-R-E.com. And here's the show. Hello, everybody. Watchers, listeners, supporters of all kinds. Welcome to another episode of the Astros Awesome Podcast. I'm your host, Chuck LaFlanche, checking in from Krabby, Thailand. Joining me in virtual studio halfway around the world back in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, is Aaron Gledo from Detox Junkie, a uh, social media page that seems to be blowing up these days. How are you doing today, Aaron? Doing very well, Chuck. Thanks for having me on the show today, man. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming. I did get it right. You are Saskatoon, right? I am. Right? Yep. Okay, okay, okay. I, I've seen you in in the studio over at Dan, so I assumed that you were, you know, right? <laughs> if you're in person right. at Dan, you're, you're from Saskatoon or from somewhere close to I kind of thing. So you got it. I, I should say that's at Hard Knocks Talks. Go check them out, guys. They're they're a good podcast. There, second best recovery podcast out of Canada, I should say. <laughs> I see. Same way he refers to me. What's you know, right? So, hey, yeah, listen. Absolutely. Before we get into your story, there's there's a quick series of questions I always like to ask. I forgot to tell you about this going into it, so I'm going to blindside you a little bit with it, but it's not really. And I'm, and I, I'm always getting to a place when I ask these questions, Aaron. When's the first time you remember getting messed up? First time I remember getting messed up, I was 16 years old, and I okay. was in Roberts Creek, B.C., and uh, okay. I was, uh, it's, a, it's a brief story. It, I was at a friend of mine's house. We'll call him Mark because that's what his name is. And uh, I won't say his initials, and, uh, but his name is Mark, right? Yeah, exactly. We yeah. we we took you know like quintessential sort of teenagers, uh, filled up a big glass from his parents' liquor cabinet, and I was so intrigued by alcohol. I had tasted alcohol at this point, and I knew that it sparked something in me. I didn't know why. I didn't know why I was drawn to it, but I knew I wanted it. And okay. uh, even before I'd ever been drunk. So I had this big call, tall glass of, of shit mix, essentially, and I chugged that thing down, and boom, I was off to the races, man, and that was yeah. it. That just that sparked do, 26 years of addiction. So do you remember how it made you feel specifically at that point? 100%. I really do. And, and how was it's that? It's profound. Yeah, it's profound to look back that long in my life and remember so, so clearly how it felt the first time that I poured that much alcohol down my throat. And there was a euphoria unlike anything. And I have to be honest about that. It was a euphoric experience. And sure, I was sick as a dog very soon after drinking that. But the euphoria that came with it, I wanted. I was listening to Nirvana. It was cranked. It was in the early 90s. And like the whole grunge scene was blowing up on the West Coast. And I was on the West Coast of BC at the time, Canada. And, uh, and yeah, the whole, the whole environment, it just, it sucked me in. I wanted more instantly, man. Yeah. So did you at the time, were you self-aware enough at the time to understand how profound that was for you? Or does that, does that come with the benefit of hindsight? Yeah, it comes with the benefit of hindsight for sure. So at the time, by, by the time I was 16, I knew I felt different. I knew I was different and I do have ADHD and it's diagnosed and it's moderate to severe. So it's pretty, it's a substantial amount of ADHD, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'd gone through my life with this, not knowing why I felt so freaking different. I knew I looked at the world differently. I knew I felt differently. I knew I heard things differently. I perceived things differently. And I felt alone in the world very, very alone. So when I, the first time I, I, I tasted booze and the first time I lashed onto alcohol, it really did. It made me, it, it washed away all that anxiety. Man. It cleared my yeah. mind of that indifference and made me feel accepted. And that was something I wanted to chase hard because as a child, I was always looking for an answer and a way out. And this suddenly okay. appeared in my lap and it looked like it was one. So, okay. Okay. Um, I, I can relate to the ADHD. Um, mine was 
has been undiagnosed until very recently. I didn't even think that I might have it until I got sober because I'd been high for so long on stimulants. I'd been self-medicating, right? So all of a sudden it was like, oh shit, I'm not self-medicating and life got very real for me very fast. Yeah. Um, I'll actually say, and this, this show isn't about me, but it is something that I, I do like to speak to when it comes up. In my first six months of recovery, um, when the day I, I still remember very clearly the conversation was with my buddy's wife and she's like, well, of course you've got ADHD. Like, look at you, man, you're a train wreck and you've been self-medicating all these years. It was like, oh, oh, okay. Now I get it. And I still remember, and I still think sometimes I wish I didn't know that because here's the thing. When the chaos begins to take over and it does when it, it really does. And you can, I'm sure you can relate to that. The, the chaotic mind mm-hmm. that, that can, you know, there was a, period of time where it was like 40 bucks in a phone call man like and i can feel normal again and it was like it was those demons of addiction found a way yeah. the moment that i knew that about myself it was like yeah you know here it is you know here it is hey there's an answer for this there's an answer for this right and i really had to fight against that for some time so i think yeah. that's uh yeah. whenever somebody says that i i, I kind of jump on that right I can um, understand that though, Chuck, completely. I, I, I mean, can. the noise. But you can. Yeah, the noise yeah. in 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 my head was yeah. excruciatingly loud and confusing for a long time, mm-hmm. and I knew that drugs and alcohol could flip that switch. It could deaden that sound. It could it could provide me with relief, or at least that's the way yeah. I looked at it back then. You know, until it. So, didn't. did you look at it as relief, or did you just know that it was? You were just drawn to it. Like for myself, I didn't realize that it was relief until. It wasn't right, but so for yourself, can you say that it was relief from the noise? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. One hundred percent for okay. sure. Yeah, it it That's... smoothed things out for me. Like it was. Uh, I mean, it was absolutely the wrong way of dealing with it. For sure. <laughs> well, but it was all I knew. Did. I wouldn't suggest so with that it. Said, <laughs> with that said, and let's just talk about ADHD for a second. Now the conversation's gone there. Yeah, yeah. There is noise, but did you find? Mm-hmm throughout your life that sometimes like, like you said you looked at things differently you you, mm-hmm. you thought about things differently you all those things a strength mm-hmm. at times though too right you, you seem to excel mm-hmm. at certain things and and I'm, I'm kind of relating to my own self now but i'm so i'm asking you yeah. because you really got me curious just the way you worded that well, did you find it mm-hmm. a strength for you at times as well adhd specifically absolutely yeah right Right. I, I, I now in my sobriety and I mean, since I've been sober this time and if you followed any of Detox Junkie on my page, uh, even recently I put out a post, it, it, you know, when I sobered up in 2021, it wasn't the first time I had been through that many, many times. But this yeah. time in particular, after I got sober, I was able to do the work and really learn so much more about my ADHD, um, PTSD. I, I was diagnosed with PTSD shortly after getting sober as well which makes perfect sense. But I was able to learn about these things. Um, and I was, I'm able now to see my ADHD as a strength and a weakness. Absolutely, it is something that holds me back in certain areas of my life. I will never say ADHD is my superpower. It's not. There are aspects to it that really do help me. Um, I'm super creative. I'm super empathetic. I'm super compassionate. I listen to people well, which actually isn't isn't a, a common trait in ADHD. Often an ADHD conversation yeah. goes like this, but for some reason I become hyper focused when people are talking about their own issues, their own pain, their suffering, um, and looking so, at so me probably some, to provide probably some help. Deflection there, I would imagine, if you're anything like me. Likely, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. If I paid yeah, attention to your shit, right? it's yeah. I could take yeah. a nap, right? Yeah. Um, and that's just it. Oh, there was something that I was going to jump on you there too. Oh, geez. Ha. I don't remember what it was. Something. Yeah. No um, worries. Was, Another thing about ADHD brilliant. though, because it makes so many thoughts fly through my head so often, mm-hmm. I've learned how I can pick out certain things that strike me and, and, and preserve them and either convert them into a poem or into a piece of prose, or into a reel that I put out on my Facebook page, or what have you. But the constant flurry of activity inside my brain, I've learned how to harness that, and pull out, extract out the creative bits, and the the, the hitting, the heavy hitting parts that I want to be able to share, to be able to round out my own story, and to be able to provide help and inspiration for others. So that's a really cool thing. 
that I don't think I'd have without ADHD. Uh, so that when you do that, and, and now I'm really interested in that process because I, you've got me thinking about my own processes that way now. Yeah. <laughs> is it that, do you hyper-focus for 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour or whatever it is on something because, it, because it's there? And now it's like, as I, as I tend to do that, that's why I ask. And, and you never, mm -hmm. I never thought about it until you just said it. That, mm -hmm. that creative stuff, because I've never considered myself a creative. But now it's like, right. I come up with some really weird shit sometimes, right? And I was like, where did that ever come from? But, and, it, and it's this, I, it's, yeah, it's a thought yeah. running around that I yeah. just grab and go, boop. Right. We're going to yep. run with this for a yeah. little while. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's a curious thing that you say that, man. There's something else that I say about yeah. ADHD. Go ahead. No, no, I want to hear your thoughts on that. No, I was going to say, I, I have this weird thing and, and uh, I, I've never shared this before, but I, when I walk through life, I combine imagery with sounds and words in my head. It's, 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 it's odd. It's hard to explain, but I'll have a thought and it'll immediately transform in my head into a phrase or the start of a poem or, and this is daily life. This is just walking through the grocery store, man. I'll believe it. And then yeah, the sound yeah. of the music and then the imagery. And for some reason I've been able to learn. I don't think it's even, I think it's intuition. I think it's intuitive, but grasp all of that and put it together in such a way to be able to portray whatever message I'm I'm feeling and and really think will will resound with my own audience. Whereas like before in the past, that used to just bounce around in my head constantly, and I didn't really know what to do with it. So so not so an outlet it's, it's, now. That's that's it's provided cool. an outlet. It's provided an that's, absolutely massive outlet, and it's it's like a relief on my brain to be uh, honest. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay. So and now I remembered what I was going to say earlier. All right. Something that I often talk about with ADHD is I laugh with everybody else does at the TikToks and the whatever and the, you know, where's mm -hmm. my keys? I call it the monkey show, the monkey dance, you know, where's yeah. my keys? And you should have seen me as a drug dealer with 22 pockets in the winter, right? It was, it was <laughs> fucking nuts, right? Just constantly, you know. However, as much as I laugh along with everybody else, sometimes I wonder what it would be like not to be pissed off at myself all the time, yeah. right? And, and can you relate to that? Right? Like that. Yeah. Fuck, where'd you put your keys? Like, how can you be such a fucking dummy? You know, and I, I hate to swear that For much. Sure. I'm trying not to. But that is that is the dialogue that I have with myself, often out loud. Right? Yeah. You know, and it, yeah. and it's and I think that's the part that maybe some people don't understand. Is there's a real chaos yeah. there that is really frustrating yeah. for a lot of people. Right. You know, and it's, yeah. And you, you just know. nailed it with that word, Chuck. Chaos. Yeah. 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 Right. You're right. I, it, and Somebody that's the was, way it feels. It feels like chaos. Yeah. And, and anger, like self-loathing is a shitty thing, right? My, my experience at Yatra Center, he, um, it is. Mike, uh, Mike Miller at the Yatra really helped me to address some of that, that horrible self-talk, right? That, that, that centers around my ADHD, mm -hmm. um, but through the help of internal family systems mm -hmm. therapy, that specifically, but it's been an amazing thing just to now I catch myself. So I'll start that, con that dialogue with myself often, but I catch myself. Yeah. Right. You know, it's yeah. okay. No, man, don't do that yeah. to yourself. You know what I mean? And that's it. Yeah. 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 Self-loathing sucks. That's right. <laughs> and, and I actually put a post out about negative self-talk. Yeah. It, it sucks harsh. It's, it's, you know what? Self-loathing is, it, I can probably do more damage to myself emotionally than anybody else can at this point. I have some pretty solid <laughs> yeah. boundaries up. And I have uh, huge warning bells go off in my head when I'm being approached with any sort of narcissistic uh, opinions or um, manipulation or gaslighting. Like, it's just, I, I'm very aware of that shit. But is that negative self, self talk? And I've spoken yeah. about it before, but I'm at the stage and you just, you just shed some light on it, Chuck, is um, when it does crop up now, I'm very quick to be self aware of it happening. Yeah. And I make yeah. an effort to flip it. And I make an effort to flip it every time because that's really what's going to help you establish new behavior in, in your life. And I'm speaking you as in uh, the French term vu. I always go vu because there's a plural <laughs> you in French and not in English. But anyways, um, so the, the collective you, um, as you practice being self-aware and grabbing onto those nuggets of negativity that you produce in your head and say about yourself and you grab them. And you flip them. You, you tell yourself that's not true. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. And even if yeah. there's ADHDisms coming up, 
and you're constantly losing your keys or putting your shit in the wrong place. I do that every day. I do have some tools that I use at home now that help me with that, but it still happens. And when it does, and I start going down that, oh man, are you ever going to get this? You know what? I might not ever get this. I might not ever be able to put my keys in the exact same spot and remember where they are. And that (laughs) might be part of my ADHD and that's totally okay. And I have to let myself be okay with that. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 100%. Something I often say, and I almost guarantee you're going to relate to this one, Aaron, is uh, um, I am great at implementing systems of organization. I am terrible at maintaining them. Right. So like I can come up with a way to organize your entire life for you. Right. In subcategories and all the things. But do you think I can sure. maintain that? Not a totally. Choice, right? <laughs> right. That's that, that creative bit comes yeah. up, you know, whatever. Right. Great ideas. But um, so listen, self-loathing, you got a story. I mean, you go by detox junkie. So obviously you got a story. Sure. Tell me about some of that self-loathing. Where's that coming from? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a good segment. All right, let's talk about I it think a little that was bit. Good. So, I mean, we touched on it a little bit with the, yeah, <laughs> it's a perfect segue. <laughs> we talked a bit about ADHD and, and my childhood and growing up with those yeah. those feelings of, of less than, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So leading into my addiction, I already had established there was something wrong with me. I believed that about myself, right? So add addiction into that. And really, my addiction took off probably when I was about 18 years old. I was actually living on a kibbutz in Israel at the time. A kibbutz. And uh, I spent about five months in Israel. And uh, yeah, a kibbutz, is, it's, it's a community. It's, it's a community where people on the community all work together for a common goal of providing for the community as a whole. Um, and okay. these exist okay. all over Israel. Um, it yeah. sounds almost communist in nature. It's not. It kind of does. Um, does yeah. <laughs> but people do collectively work together. And actually, a couple of those people now follow Detox Junkie on Facebook from, you oh. know, 30, 26 years ago, whatever it was. So it's pretty yeah. cool. But I wasn't drinking like normal people. And when I got back to Canada, you know, I, I, I lived on the West Coast. I went back home and things really started falling apart. I started just, you know, um, drinking more and more. Uh, but also starting to dabble and, and experiment with drugs. And, uh, and it started a slow spiral. And I kind of got lucked out at that point. I think it could have gone south. But at that point, I was actually took a job in Toronto. And okay. so at 20 years old, I flew to Toronto. I started a new job at a resort as a server. And it kind of washed away the lifestyle I had from the past. But the booze hung on. The booze hung on yeah. big time. and And I just started the whole pattern over again in Toronto. And this pattern repeated through my 20s and 30s. I mean, when I got sober and detoxed, clean and sober in 2021, I had four other attempts before that. When I was 19, I went to eight and uh, and I wasn't ready. I thought I was different than everybody else. I thought that I didn't need it. And then, um, (laughs) you know, jumping ahead a little bit more uh, in my mid 20s, I did the same thing. And I, I, you know, it was again, I, I wasn't ready. I, I was I was different than all those old guys. I was in my mid 20s. By this point, I was back in Vancouver working at the keg restaurants. I was actually a manager for the keg for years, um, okay. which was okay. an absolutely perfect disguise. Working at working yeah. in the restaurant business is a perfect disguise for a person in addiction. I have to be honest. And and throughout my 100%. 20s, being a manager for the keg and getting invited to these big high end parties and eating great food and people all around always drinking. My addiction hid very well within the yeah. confines of that job. But yeah, inside, exactly. man, I was crushed. I was miserable. I knew where I was. I knew what was happening to me. I'd already stepped into the rooms of AA a few times at this point. So I knew that where I was going, like I had the, the knowledge behind what I was doing. And that really started implanting that self-loathing more and more and more. And the difficulties started cropping up, the credit problems, the money issues, the the multiple tickets and driving problems. I spent, you know, a day in jail here and there. That type of thing all started building up on me in my 20s and into my 30s. And um, and it didn't slow down, man. Like in my 30s, my first son was born at, uh, I think I was 30 years old-ish. No, because he's 13 now. So I was 32 when he was born. And uh, 
for a while, I was okay. I went to work and I, I went back to school. I went into health sciences and I got a job as a diagnostic technologist here in Saskatoon. And, uh, and life was okay, but you know what? It really wasn't. It was okay from the outside. I was able to hold down a job. I was able to dress myself and look decent and kind of be there for the kids. But what was happening in the home was a completely different story, Chuck. And I was yeah. just sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into self-loathing and pulling myself away from that entire environment and isolating myself. Hey, listeners, let's take a moment to talk about something crucial, carrying naloxone. This life-saving medication can reverse an opioid overdose in minutes. You might think, I don't need it. I'm not around opioids. But the truth is, you'll never know when you'll be in a situation where you could save a life. It's easy to use, and many places offer it for free or at a low cost. So let's be prepared and look out for each other. Remember, you might not plan on being around opioid use, but you never know when it'll be around you, and you could save the life of somebody that is loved. This is Jared Blaine with the Blacklist Podcast, and remember, you are loved. So, okay. It was fucking brutal. It was, it was the most lonely period of my life, especially the last few years leading up to when I decided to go to treat. And those few years were ridiculously dark. Um, COVID came right before I went to treatment. And that was the catalyst on my addiction. And I think COVID could have gone two ways for me, and it almost did. It could have gone to death, or it could have gone the route I took, which is which has propelled me into treatment. But the first little I while think, in, in when COVID hit, Chuck, I was deeply... Yeah, go I, ahead. I think, I think COVID did that to a lot of people. A lot of people, right? Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, Mm-hmm. What COVID did for addiction in North America, especially, and I, I can't speak to the rest of the world, it was awful. It really was, right? You've got, if addiction yeah. is a lack of connection, is the opposite yeah. of connection, then whoa, right? What did COVID do, right? It isolated so yeah. many of us, right? Yeah. And I, I shudder Absolutely. to think at how many lives are still directly, you know, ruined as a result of that, right? Or ruined directly. So, so and I'm, I'm glad that you, that you managed to go that way. What, I agree, what kind man. of pushed you into recovery? What, what pushed you into it? A year before I got into Cedars at Cobble Hill, which is where I went for my treatments in British Columbia. And um, I have no affiliation with them, but I can't recommend them enough. They're amazing. Um, okay. yeah. It was a year before I went in and I was sitting in a field in my vehicle and I was trying to decide whether I should take my own life. And um, sitting in that vehicle that night, and it was the darkest night of my entire life, sitting there and thinking of my kids at home and thinking about the world around me and thinking where I fell short. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out. I was, I was looking for a spot in my life, something, some catalyst that had put me to this point. Because it didn't add up to me. I didn't, I didn't think... It was such a confusing spot, Chuck. Like, I, I knew I didn't want to live the life I was in, and I didn't know how to get out. And I thought maybe that was the only answer. While I was thinking of that in that field, I was suddenly overcome with this crazy sense of hope, Chuck. And it came from nowhere. I have no idea. I mean, maybe, you know, I am spiritual, I do believe in a God of my understanding. I don't know where the sense of hope came to me while I was sitting in that vehicle, but I knew at that point that I wanted to live and that I had to find a way out of addiction. And I drove home that night and I walked into the house and I probably stank like booze because I was drinking heavily while I was out in that farmer's field. And I read stories to my three boys and I told them that I loved them and As I read stories, I was crying. I remember sobbing while I was reading to my boys, and they were, you know, very, very young, not understanding, probably scared, to be honest, now that I look back. You know, their dad's crying, reading them a story. But I was so overwhelmed with a sense of love and a sense of hope and a sense of purpose. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew, in order to live the life that I was supposed to live, I had to find a way out of addiction. It took me a year from that point to get into treatment. And I tried everything. I tried going back to AA and NA. I tried outpatient detox. I tried so many different things. I was going to counselors and therapists. 
I needed the ICU of addiction therapy, which was for me an intensive treatment program for 60 days. Okay. Okay. So, so you say it took you a year to yeah. get into treatment. Did it, it took you a year to get like to bring yourself to that point or it took you a year administratively to get into treatment? Like, clarify that part. It took me a year to get to that point where I realized that was the option I had to go for. Okay. Okay. okay I didn't okay. really consider it. Um, it basically over the course of that year, I think because I was so keyed on trying to get out of addiction, even though I was still living in addiction for that year and it was a fucking terrible year, Chuck, it was brutal, man. But at the same time, I was searching and searching and searching for the right things that would grab me and, and help me give me that, give me the tools, give me, give me that leverage to be able to pop myself out of that lifestyle. And because I tried everything, I reached a point where it was suggested to me, you got to try treatment. And actually Cedars at Cobble Hill was suggested to me as well by a woman that lives in, in Saskatchewan. Her name's Wendy Gore Hickman, and she's an advocate okay. with addiction and mental health. And she's actually a, she's an, uh, a retired physician. And uh, okay. so okay. I got her name. She, she basically coached me through the last month of my addiction and was just sort of say, suggesting to me she her her words kept me alive on some days i'm sure they did but mm. suggesting about treatment by the time i decided to go to treatment i reached out to them i, I actually got in I, I flew out to bc i was in treatment eight days after i called them oh nice very nice. quick good yeah good yeah. Good. good yeah good. you know i actually and, and i'll take this moment to plug one of my sponsors cwc um just before you and i started recording a friend of mine living in saskatchewan right now it's still in regina had reached out to me the, this evening for me because it's you know it's the middle of the night here for me mm -hmm. and said i'm ready is there anything you can do so i i've i sent the email off to twc i'm just waiting to hear back from them right now about hey like we need to get can we do something for this person and i know they're going to come through for me, right so that's awesome. cwc is together we can uh recovery society for anybody that's listening they um they're the title sponsor of this episode yeah they are so um they are the biggest treatment facility in Canada, a recovery, they are a recovery society. They're not a treatment center. They have every asset. They have detox, intern housing, treatment. They, they, they just cover it all. So that's awesome. They are, they are my original sponsor. So um, I, I reached out to the executive director there in hopes that, that maybe we could find my friend some help. And just you saying that now is like, yeah. So that geography, geography. So this friend that I'm, that I've, made that email for her on behalf of her she has done the gambit in saskatchewan right mm -hmm. estvan she's done the the moose jaw detox which let's talk about moose jaw detox i don't know if you have any familiarity with them down there but that program is fucking amazing what they do there. is it it's incredible it is oh wow okay it's absolutely when i was there there was people coming from all over canada there was three different groups of people that had come through um, some from the East Coast, from Central Canada, and maybe it was Northern Saskatchewan, somebody else, but to see what, what they were doing differently because it's such a great program. Like, they're just, mm -hmm. they're amazing. Um, Chad, can't remember his last name, um, it, the, the director there of the Waccamo Health Region, or that Waccamo, whatever it is, again, I'm not going to try and remember all the names, but he is just this, this fantastic character who cares so much and he's built a program around results. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Back to geography. So this friend, we'll call her Kay, has done the gambit. But the problem, the challenge is when you're in your part of the world and you're ready to like, okay, now nah, this isn't for me. You find a resentment, you, all the things that you do. And you know, if you went through all of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I found a resentment in the rooms and, and whatever. But you can just make that phone call. Somebody will come pick you up. Because misery loves company. There's always somebody out there with a bag of meth or a down or whatever your drug of choice is that's going to come yeah. pick you up, right? Mm -hmm. And because again, misery just loves company. But so does healing. So does recovery. Um, well, you just nailed me, it too. Yeah, healing and What's recovery that? loves company. Sorry. Damn straight we do, right? <laughs> Damn yeah. straight. Yeah. Um, I actually just I made that meme the other day. It was like one of my one of my best ones I've made. Yeah. So <laughs> nice <laughs> to get out of the environment. So for me, moving away from Saskatchewan back to Calgary, my hometown, mm -hmm. um, is what it took for me to get sober. Mm -hmm. And people say, "Well, you still you're still you wherever you go when you are," but geography can make a huge difference in somebody's life, right? Okay. Not people, places, things, right? So yeah. I don't I don't know how you feel about that, but you know. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, when I was like jumping back when I was 19, 20 years old and jumping out of the situation I was in, I was living in a crappy little rental house with a bunch of buddies. And really, we were only keyed on partying our faces off as hard as we possibly could at that time. <laughs> Sounds and familiar. Right. Yeah. I, I know because because the the hooks of addiction had always already kind of latched into me more than my mm -hmm. peers that I was around. They were going through just a party phase in their 20s. I wasn't. I, I was on a whole different level, you know, and at that time, that geographical swap, when I flew to Toronto and started work out east and knew no one and knew nobody in any scene, that actually really did suppress the the progression of my addiction for a short period of time, you know, yeah. Yeah. and and also yeah. when, when I was going through this time in in, in, uh, in Seashelt, I was on the West Coast in a little town called Seashelt in my early 20s there. Um, I was using, you know, as I was playing with a lot of hard drugs that I actually stopped playing with for a time when I moved yeah. as well. Yeah. So I don't know if those would have gotten their hooks into me faster. But, yeah, I, I tried a lot of different shit. man. I tried crystal meth. I tried PCP. I done coke, like all that stuff like was was part of my life. And at that time, that geographical swap, just getting me out of that environment really did suppress that that, that activity. Yeah, right. So, yeah. and and maybe who knows? You can't go back in time, and things play out the way they're meant to play out. But perhaps had you, you know, been able to find the right program at the right time, you could have capitalized on that that kind of gap maybe. or that that break, right? But who knows, right? Who knows? So who knows? Hindsight, hindsight, just vision is perfect, right? That being said, um, if I found the right program back then, I wouldn't be sitting here with you right now. But like I say, things work out the way they're supposed to, right? You exactly. Know, yeah. Um, I, myself, I was 25 years, right. And ups and downs and backs and forths and all that stuff. Right. But, yeah. um, a lot of bad things have happened in that time, but in the last year, a lot of good things have happened and none of that happens without that 25 years. Right. That's so, right. you know, we're, we all do what we do and, you know, and there's a reason for it. I mean, whatever you want to believe, whatever your spiritual place is, you know, right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So. Thank God for uh, for Cedar. I'm sorry, Cedars. Cedars at Cobble Hill. Cobble Hill. Okay, yeah. I know I've heard yeah. of them because I've, I've I've looked at all the treatment facilities in, in BC, yeah. um, mainly looking for sponsorship. If I'm going to be honest. But... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hear um, you. I'll be doing that too. So, yeah, fair enough, right? Um, thank God for them. So now you come out of treatment. You found some. You found recovery. How do you get to a place where a detox junkie is the handle? And, and this is what you're doing. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. While I was in treatment, I found a voice. And it didn't take okay. me long. My, my initial detox took about six days. If you guys want to read about that, there's uh, poems and articles on my page and website about it. But my initial detox mm -hmm. took six days, and it was harrowing. It was freaking brutal. I had a really, yeah. really rough detox. I was, I was not prepared for how rough it was going to be coming off alcohol after that long. Um, yeah. yeah, it was really rough. After that, though, I, you know, I hit the ground running like gangbusters. And actually, the very first day I walked into treatment, I told the director of, our, of Cedars, I said to him, I will do anything you guys ask me to do while I'm here. I won't ask questions. I'm in your hands. Yeah. I trust you guys. I'm all in. And I stuck to that. Yeah. I stuck to that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, like like you probably know, and maybe some other some other of your viewers know, when you're in treatment, like you can't make your own decisions. And you know why? Because your own decisions yeah. have got you really messed up. So, yeah, your own decisions got you to treatment. So right, yeah, like, yeah. So they yeah, take so that away you need from a treatment. You. I should say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But they they de they do they remove a lot of the decision making ability from you when you're in treatment. And one hundred percent. A lot of people fight against that at first. They feel like, oh, I don't want to be controlled or I don't want to be treated like a six-year-old or whatnot. But for me, I was like, you know what? I'm learning how to walk again. I am six. My, my mental capacity has been so, like, just beat up over for so many decades that I need to be treated like an infant in some ways. Please take my yeah. responsibility. Please take my 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 choice right now and tell me mm -hmm. and that's really yeah. what i needed yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough right I, I i don't think that's unique to yours well, obviously it's not there's a reason that they do things like that right yeah but you know there's there's one aspect of treatment that that i didn't realize at the time it was happening kind of outside of my awareness but it was definitely happening 
the micro movements. Do you know what I mean when I when I talk about micro movements? Nope. No. Okay. So our Wednesday episodes with Ryan Bathgate, he's helped me to understand a lot of this micro movements. You have to make your bed treatment, right? Oh, okay, you have a yeah. chore you have to do. You yeah. have to all those things. Yeah. There's a there's a psychology behind that. And mm -hmm. that's the micro movements. So you make your bed every day, and just for a second, whether we admit it to ourselves or not, just for a second, you're proud of yourself. Yeah. Right? Like because you made your, you cleaned your room or you made your bed. This is shit, totally. especially in like a hardcore act of addiction, make my bed. I can't even imagine like that was so far past anything that I was like even thinking about, right? But totally. Um so just for a second, you're proud of yourself. You, yeah. you mop the floor, you do a good job of it. Just for a second, you're proud of yeah. yourself. Right. Yeah. And that begins to build some intrinsic value. And and that's that there's a whole process there that, that begins for you, right? Totally. So yeah. It, it starts with that and, and it moves into bigger things. And all of a sudden, you know, um, myself, I just now, after a year, started focusing on that bed because now I understand how yeah. important it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> to making yeah. sure that yeah. I make it every single day, right? Um, yeah. And cleaning up the house every single day and, you know, all those things that I, yeah. I used to let slide for a week or two at a time. Or yeah. And those things do make <laughs> you feel accomplished and they do make you feel good. Even though yep. uh, I still let those things slide sometimes from here and <laughs> from time to time myself, but absolutely. I think we all do. We all do, but, right? Um, um, I, I for kinda, me, it's just, I, 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 yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I kind of, I kind of, I just was realizing I went sideways on your question there. You were asking how or where Detox Junkie kind of came out of all of oh, this. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so we both went sideways. Um, yeah. <laughs> when I was in, yeah, and then <laughs> yeah, we sure we sure did. Um, yeah. And then uh, so in treatment, I started speaking in, in in the rooms, and I got an opportunity to tell my whole story in the room. So I was able to actually speak for forty minutes. It's the, it's the longest I'd ever spoken at that point about myself, and and it just came so fluidly. And um, when I left treatment, there were a lot of really heavy things I had to do to reestablish my life. Like I was living in sober living houses, and I was doing a hundred meetings in a hundred days or 90 and 90, or, you know, I was probably more yeah, than that. Yeah. Hundreds of hours of therapy. I was in, you know, treatment for PTSD very shortly after. So there's a lot of things I had to do. But through all of this, I continued to have a voice. So I was speaking out more and more at meetings. I was talking to people about recovery. I was open with my own recovery and my own history from the get-go. And it reached a point where I needed an outlet. Now, also before this, I've always been a writer. So I've had, like, I've got hundreds of poems. I've got books of poetry that I started writing when I was 15 years old. And I continued doing that throughout my addiction. Um, a lot okay. of dark stuff, obviously. But yeah. as I came out of my addiction, as I embraced my recovery, I found that my words really started to flow with some purpose and meaning. Um, and I needed an outlet, man. So like talking about Detox Junkie, all I wanted to do at first was open a Facebook page where I could start being more of an advocate of mental health and, and addiction. And really my go-to is being an advocate of mental health and addiction without ever having any stigma or judgment and crushing the stigma and judgment that's really associated with mental health and addiction and learning Damn how to straight. live as my true authentic self. And that's what I want to portray through Detox Junkie. And that's, that's it, man. That is the main goal. And to help as many people that are suffering as humanly possible. That's the right. main goal. And so when I started the page, I, um, I got some pretty quick immediate validation check and it felt good. People responded to what I was saying. People responded to the way I was thinking and portraying the, my own thoughts and experiences out of addiction um, yeah. and, and being able to reach out and, and really make an impact on people that felt alone, people that had questions, people that were struggling with confusion and whatnot. So mm -hmm. it was really, really, it was a pivotal movement. And I realized how, how much of an impact I could have. And then basically from there, over the last five months, Detox Junkie has just continued to take off. And now it's leading into bigger and bigger things. This year, I'm going to actually get incorporated. I'm reaching out for sponsors. I'm going to be um, putting in some programs that I can actually, you know, help people in our communities around Saskatchewan with, and there's some other work that I'm involved in. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's hard work. It's a grind, but it's exactly where I'm supposed to be. It, yeah. We have some parallels, my friend. We do. Um, and I'm not going to go into yeah. your, your story is very similar to mine. And I think I, without getting in all the details, right. Um, finding that voice, finding a reason, right. And it, it just, one of the things, and I, I, I've been talking a lot about this lately, so let's talk about this. 
community, recovery community. You've got your local recovery community, which is so important, but the power of the internet, what that's done for recovery community is just yeah. mind blowing, isn't it? Um, you and mm -hmm. I are having a conversation, right? So social media <laughs> is not a great thing in so many ways, but in a lot of ways, it's a great thing. You and yeah. I are having a conversation that totally. with the power of social media is going to get out to more people, right? I mean, the, the podcast isn't on Facebook, but that's mm -hmm. where most people come across it, right? More than that, though. Mm -hmm. I've got my, my community, our community. You've got your community. Trap House Testimonies has theirs. Hard Knocks Talks has theirs. Sober Squad, Jamie Tall, Sonia Johnson. The list goes on. And totally. now, yeah. much like, and I made, a, I made a comparison. Remember in health class, when you first learned about STDs and about how if you sleep with one person, you've slept with everybody. It's the same thing. It's that same, it extrapolates out in this yeah. massive way without all the antibiotics. <laughs> it's like this same, you know, it's this, it's this crazy right. community that, that, that absolutely, like, around the world. I'm in Thailand. You're in Saskatchewan, Canada. Yeah. Um, I had somebody yesterday from yeah. Ireland reach out to me. I, you know, it's, um, it's amazing yeah. recovery community, right? It, it really is. And I just, to me, sometimes it's overwhelming when I think about how many people we can help doing this, right? Yeah. And, you know, which is why it's, I find myself that's living just in Thailand. It. You just nailed it. And yeah, social media does that for us. It opens the doors of being able to help so many more people. If I look at the followers of my Facebook page, and I only, I just, I'm just shy of 14,000. But like, my biggest demographics, the US, second biggest is England, or the UK, or I should say, Third is okay. Canada, really? and then we're into Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, and that's kind of the yeah. breakdown. But my page is truly international, and yeah. the sharing yeah. that occurs on my page is truly international. The suffering that, cool? mm -hmm. that we experience within mental health and addiction and the tools we use to pull ourselves out of them and the encouragement, motivation, inspiration we can grab on the other side is a language that traverses borders and yeah, language it itself, if you know what that. I'm saying. And, and it's I phenomenal. Do, yeah. It's phenomenal to see that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's uplifting and, it, and it's incredible, right? So. Um, Hugely. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Usually. I, yeah, there's other times, right? There's other times. I, I can tell you. <laughs> just, Oh yeah, we got lots to right? talk about. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, you know, and I well, I can tell you already, we're we're gonna have more episodes to be recorded with you, Aaron. Um, not that we're at the end of this one yet. Sounds um, good. There's it's. Yep. Let's talk about sense of humor in recovery. <laughs> hey, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the whole thread that kind of blew up on me there. There's maybe I call it a code Karen. Probably shouldn't have called it a code Karen. But uh, yep. <laughs> there's the, the meme. <laughs> yeah. Did you do you know the one I'm talking about? Uh, no. Um, there's a meme I posted. I do. Comparing, I sure do. Yeah. Oh, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Where Chantel jumped in there with some pretty outrageous things. Yeah, and, I saw mm, it. Geez. Yeah, okay. it got kind of crazy. And it's yeah. for the for the woman. I should not say code Karen. That's horrible. For the, <laughs> the woman. That, that was so offended on behalf of people that have suffered an addiction. I don't, and, and I think mm -hmm. I went wrong trying to explain to her the sense of humor. Because if you don't get it, you don't get it. If you haven't lived it, you just haven't lived it. And maybe you'll never will get it. Mm -hmm. But when you've been through mm -hmm. hell, when you've lived mm -hmm. through the closest thing to hell that you can as a human is what it, well, that, that we have, everything's relative, right? There's, there's certainly yeah. some things that, might, that would be considered worse, but the bar has moved. Things that you find funny are different than, than what normal people. Yeah. Our loved ones, my mom yeah. laughs at shit that most moms would be horrified at, right? <laughs> you know, but it's like, totally. you got it now, right? Totally. Like, you know, so <laughs> yeah. are you, uh, yeah, so you yeah. did see that thread. What are, what are your thoughts on sense of humor? You, yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I think, I think it's, um, I mean, <laughs> And I don't want to exclude anybody, but I don't think people that have, like, if you haven't lived through active addiction and regained a sense of self 
afterwards in recovery and regained who you are and, and, and regained a, a, a new perception of the world and opened yourself up. If you haven't gone through that process, I think it would be hard or, okay, two things. I think A, it would be easy to be offended by some of the humor that is used in recovery. Um, yeah. But B, at the same time, it would be hard to understand why people in recovery find it funny in the first place. And I'm not talking about any sort of in or specific joke or or um, phrase or pun or I'm just talking in general because yeah. you just said it, man. We we walked out of fucking hell, and I'm serious. Yeah. I, I am right there with you. I don't know what is lower than that on earth for me. Certainly nothing I've ever experienced. There's nothing else in my life that has put me on literally the precipice of choosing life or death. Mm -hmm. And I've had that decision in recovery or not in recovery in active addiction. Yeah. I chose, I, yeah. I had a, I literally stood at the edge and said this way or this way, you know, yeah. and thank God I chose the way I did, but mm -hmm. there's nothing closer to hell than that. And no, that does no. put, there isn't Hey, Yeah. No, I agree. No. It's, it's, yeah, it's freaking brutal, bro. It's absolutely brutal. I, I'll, I'll tell you something that I've, I've spoken to once. And so having humor year. about that, I, I mean, yeah. No, um, go ahead. I want to hear what you have to yeah, say, Chuck. Yeah. Sorry, I was just basically there tying a, that in. But. Yeah, no, no, no. There was a period of time, the last year, year and a half of my active addiction. I, I never used opiates. I never used fentanyl or morphine or heroin or any of that. But I, I sold some for a while. Mm -hmm. and I'm not proud of that. But we do what we do when we're in it. Um, there was a time where mm -hmm. I carried a, a portion of fentanyl with me in case that was the day when I finally had the guts. And I did that for a long time. And the odd time that I would sell it because I wanted my drug of choice and I had to, I felt naked without it. Because I was like, it was this weird, messed up right. sense of comfort that maybe today was the day when I finally Gosh. had the guts to do yeah. it. Right. What a what a fucking crazy way to think, right? So and so I can really relate to what you're saying. No, there's um, there's slightly there's, different, but same thing, right? Yeah. You know, and to try and explain to somebody that hasn't had that experience, it's almost it's just it's you know there's no point, right? And and that's where I I went wrong by engaging the way I did and like yeah, going I on mean, as long as I did, right? But, you know. That's that's it is it's crazy, but I completely understand where you were at. You were carrying around insurance in your pocket, yeah. death insurance. Yeah, shit got right. too bad. You were you you had your out, and and mm -hmm. very similar to that, Chuck. Um, on the night that I told you about where I chose life or death, um, what I didn't tell you is I actually forgot my wallet that night, and I had some money on me, and my whole plan was to get some tubing to attach to my exhaust to my vehicle. And I'm not going into any more details other than that, but basically that was my plan, but I had to buy the tubing. And so I realized I forgot my wallet. I had 20 bucks in my pocket. I could buy the tubing or I could buy the booze that I needed to do the job. Mm -hmm. You know where I spent the money? On the booze. I spent it on the booze because yeah. I'm here in front of you right now. My addiction was more powerful at that moment than my desire to escape. Wow, and you I, know what? In yeah. that instant, Thank God it was. Yeah, no kidding. That's fucked up. No kidding. Yeah, you know what I mean. My addiction <laughs> saved my mean? life that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As like that's mess. As it, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. That is that's crazy. It's a horrible way to think. That yeah. just shows you the power of addiction. It is. It does. It's yeah. it's twisted yeah. and it's disgusting. And at the time, it's all I could see. Yeah, no kidding, eh? No kidding. Yeah. Hey, listen, Aaron, um, we're, we're getting to that Crazy. time here. Um, as much as we could, we could talk about so much more. Um, I'm glad that we've had the conversation that we have. Um, I think so. Like I Me said, too. previous to, uh, to recording, um, kind of over the blood and guts of it. And these are the conversations I just love having. I just love having these ones, right? About, about all the different things. Mm -hmm. And um, we could talk yeah. for hours and hours. Um, that does bring us to my favorite part of the show, and that is the daily gratitudes. So what you got for us today? I love this part of the show, Chuck, and I'm so glad that I get to do it with you today. Um, you know what? Gratitude, the first thing that comes to mind 
is my relationships in my life. Um, uh, actually, that's the second thing that comes to mind, but I'll do it in reverse order. Gratitude, relationships in my life with the people that I truly love, that I'm able to nourish with and have authentic, real, living relationships with these people based on who we truly are. Holy shit, man. That is daily gratitude right there. Every mm. single day that shines through the most. Absolutely. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. And you mentioned the other another thing one? Is my recovery. Yeah. Being me. Yeah, just being me, being authentically me and being able to live in my own skin and being able to continuously become more and more comfortable with myself. I won't say I'm like glowing and floating around on a carpet yet, but I'm I'm doing better. Well, I'll tell you so. what, um, I, I, I posted a meme the other day that, that it occurred to me is the day that I feel like I am done healing, I am obviously not done learning and there's so much more to go, right? And I, yeah. I, think, uh, I think we're all there as humans, so... Mm -hmm. Um, for, for my daily gratitudes, first off, I'm great for another great conversation. You never know what I'm going to get into when I'm doing these. And, you know, we hadn't talked at all previous to, to, to today. So I think it's just great, man. And it's just, it's just wonderful mm -hmm. when we do this. Um, I'm very, very grateful. So I've got my scooter and my, my sidecar ready to go so that my dog and I can get out there and explore Thailand together. Um, yeah, I best believe the GoPro is going to go up on that sidecar as well. We're going to document that entire journey with the two of us. I am beyond excited about this. I'm beyond excited. He is my, my best friend. And he's, hey, he just got me through the holidays. So it's just him and I. And, you know, I love that. So, um, and my last gratitude is going to go out to awesome. every single person who continues to watch, listen, and support you guys. Like, comment, share. Please keep doing what you're doing. It's working. We are growing. We are growing faster than ever. Um, hit the buttons mm -hmm. down at the bottom. I never know where they are when I'm doing this. So just, you know, the ones that you got to hit. Uh, we very much do appreciate every single time you do any one of these things. Anytime you do, you're getting me a little bit closer to living my best life. My best life is to make a humble living spreading the message. The message is this. If you're in active addiction right now, today could be the day. Today could be the day that you start a lifelong journey. Reach out to a friend, reach out to a family member, call into detox, go to a meeting. I don't care. Do whatever it is you got to do to get started because it is so much better than the alternative. And if you have a loved one who's suffering an addiction mm -hmm. right now, I'm just taking the time to listen to our conversation. If you could just take one more minute out of your day and text that person, let them know they are loved. Use the word. I love you. You are loved. That little glimmer of hope just might be the thing that brings them back. There's a delay in the sound, um, which are in the...